Uh, welcome to the final lecture in SciArc's Fall 2011 uh, evening lecture series. Um, and it's with great pleasure tonight that I introduce a uh, very good friend and colleague, John Southern. Um, when I was thinking about how to introduce John's work and how to contextualize it, um, a term came to mind. The term was pushing the envelope. Pushing the envelope is the terminology that Sanford Quinter once used to describe a particular attitude towards architectural practice. Practice being understood both as the constellation of individuals forming the office, but more significantly, practice as the repertoire of techniques through which that group operates and communicates. The work of John Southern and urban operations belongs to this strain of architectural practice described by Quinter and its propensity for transforming the disciplinary boundaries of architecture through embracing and amplifying certain protocols that would appear to originate outside of the discipline or to have resonance uh, beyond the discipline. The technological metaphor that Quinter used, the performance envelope, refers to an aircraft and the resilience of its design um, in the context of specific environmental factors. Pushing the envelope means taking the aircraft beyond its designated altitude or speed limits. This reflects one aspect of what we might call architectural performance. It implies that there are specific parameters within which the practice of architecture operates. That architecture, in fact, may have a speed limit. But what is the nature of this speed limit and where is it imposed? possibly within the realm of material, technological, geometric, programmatic, social, political, or economic contingencies that inform both the design process as well as its end product. Exceeding the architectural speed limit undoubtedly opens up new possibilities in the terrain of how we engage with both material and informational regimes. For a practice like urban operations, this might entail embracing otherwise generic spatial qualities. For example, the relation between vertical circulation and parking within the skyscraper envelope, and intensifying these to an extent that new qualities, new architectural qualities begin to emerge, spawning unlikely hybrids of public and private access, vehicular circulation, storage, and ultimately programmatic hacking. This aspect of exceeding the speed limit or performance envelope of architecture relates to redefining the conventional set of problems as given and establishing new areas for innovation. The architectural lexicon thereby expands and the skyscraper surfaces in various guises. The sumo scraper and the slop scraper become utterly plausible constituents of our urban environment. Recent debates on the nature of contemporary architectural practice have identified a distinction between critical versus projective practices, aligning the former mode of practice with representation and the latter with performance. What something looks like as opposed to what it does. A multivalent implementation of architectural performance, one that involves an agile negotiation between imaging and performing, begins to surface in the work of, opera, of urban operations that we will see tonight. John Southern is the founding principal of Urban Operations, an LA-based studio specializing in both architecture and urban research projects. He holds a Bachelor's of Architectural Design from the University of Florida and a Master's of Architecture from SciArc. So we welcome him back. John is a professor in practice at Woodbury University's School of Architecture, and he participates in community outreach and education through his work on the board of directors of the Los Angeles Forum for Architecture and Urban Design. As a journalist, he has written pieces for Domus, Tropalism.com, Loud Paper, Manu, Junkjet, and Form Magazine publications specializing in the field of urban culture and design. John is also the founder of DrowningInCulture.com, which I recommend visiting, an ever-expanding archive of design, art, music, and metropolitan culture. So John, welcome very much uh, to SciArc. Thanks.
so I have an incredibly bloated PowerPoint presentation and 12 pages of notes, but, well, and now I just, there we go. That's never a good sign. Um, so I'm going to try to actually keep this relatively on time so that everyone can hit the beer or dinner or whatever their predilection is at this point in the evening. Um, I want to thank everyone for, for coming out. I, I know it's for a lot of people, especially students, it's um, almost the finals week and you all are probably head down and noses into your computers. And so it's great to see some familiar faces out there as well as um, some old friends from SciArc and uh, also some faculty that I haven't seen in, in quite a long time. Um, let me just get to my first slide. So I want to thank Marcelin for her incredibly heartfelt introduction. A lot of the stuff that we're going to see tonight, I actually explored with her and her partner, Bill Moline, over their kitchen table at, at their house, um, sometimes late into the evening after several bottles of wine, we sort of came to the conclusion that um, architecture was kind of hopeless, but maybe there were some answers somewhere and all it would take is another sort of meeting around the table and maybe a few more bottles of wine. So we've, I think over the past five years, managed to sort of curate something that um, I certainly um, and then am indebted to them for. And of course, Bill was one of the first uh, contributors to the skyscraper pamphlets as a, a sort of um, a critic who, who participated. And I'll get to that later in the lecture. Um, I want to also thank Shane for his um, really amazing coordination as the sort of lecture uh, go-to guy here at SciArc. He was kind of constantly in contact with me since I got the invitation and has sort of runs a pretty tight ship. And it sort of made me feel great that the culture of uh, student participation is still alive and well here at SciArc. And um, that means that the school will undoubtedly endure because it's ultimately the students who keep it going. Um, and I also want to congratulate uh, Eric and his faculty for, and the students, of course, for getting the school to a point where we can own the building. When I graduated from SciArc in 2002, that was not such a certain future. Um, Neil had done a wonderful and admirable job of transitioning the school from Beethoven Street to downtown, and he was able to sort of hand over the task of um, settling into our new digs to Eric, and uh, I really want to congratulate everybody who's been part of the legacy over the last 10 years and um, welcome the faculty and, and students to being property owners because now you get to enjoy all the benefits that come along with that. Hence, I'm wondering when there's going to be a call via email to start painting the building again or fixing the plumbing. Um, finally, I, I want to also talk about, this is really an honor to be here because um, I did actually sort of feel that I was at SIRC at a very particular time in the school's evolution. Uh, schools or institutions go through a lot of different benchmarks in their growth, and I, I feel that I was lucky enough to be part of SIRC when it made a physical transition, uh, but also a cultural transition from um, the sort of um, beach communities of Marina del Rey, Venice, and Santa Monica to kind of down and dirty downtown that had yet to realize the sort of um, glamorous loft lifestyle that it's enjoying now. And so it was really, uh, it's really fantastic to come back and see the school thriving and see everybody sort of um, producing and making some amazing looking stuff and also see the expansion of the shop knowing sort of culture of making that's part of SciArc. Um, it's really great to see that that's enduring through the new robotics lab and all the different digital fabrication um, components that have been part of the expansion of the shop. Um, I'm going to start this evening with some nostalgic uh, images. And these images are from my graduate thesis from SciArc. And the only reason I'm sort of going to take on this self-indulgent track is that um, these images actually had a very um, cogent uh, impact on the way I shaped my practice. And basically, at the time, we were in the, just at the aftermath of September 11th, it was a, sort of October of 2001, and um, I think that there was a kind of culture shock that was emanating throughout, not just a larger sort of architectural culture, but also students of architecture at the time were sort of beginning to sort of question exactly what 
was important within the discipline and what they wanted to pursue as not just as sort of um, academics, but as practitioners as well. And so the thesis that I undertook here at SciArc, which I presented um, in just under 10 years ago, was a critique of what I saw unfolding within the culture of September 11th and the subsequent competition that was held um, to generate the content for Ground Zero. And what resulted was uh, a two-part project. One, a book that was a manifesto of sorts, rejecting ornamentation, rejecting any sort of visual differentiation in favor of a culture of homog homogenization. And then the second part, of course, was a built argument, which was took the form of this model and was sort of represented in the traditional way of schematic plans, sections, et cetera. The idea behind the proposal was that, in, in a way, I sort of was looking down the pipe and seeing what we're encountering now with parametricism and suggesting that if we were going to understand architectural culture, we needed to actually understand it for what it really was, which was a calcification of capitalism. And so the project sought to sort of find a representational methodology of uh, showing that and demonstrating that. And the ultimate, just not to be too long-winded, but the ultimate uh, building program was a loft because my argument was the loft, the traditional loft, not the sort of glammed up thing you see now. The loft was ultimately the purest expression of capital possible and that it was an empty space that the individual would fill with their consumptive items and ultimately find their identity through those actions. So after that, several years passed, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but um, I actually want to take a brief detour here and talk about the larger culture that my office is seeking to critique or to operate within. And I'm not picking on China because it's an easy target, but simply the only place in uh, Southeast or in Asia that I've been. So I have the most uh, curated knowledge of the, the place and its sort of urban effects. And I want to sort of use this as a way of talking about the culture that at the time I was sort of beginning to notice, but now has, of course, permeated the discipline, not just in schools, but in um, sort of the, the design press and popular culture as well. And for me, it was incredibly enlightening to go to uh, Southeast Asia and to China and see the sort of um, rampant urban destruction that was being sort of unfolding in cities that already had a very porous and rich urban history and that were ultimately being sort of felled in the name of uh, capitalist, the expansion of capitalist space. So on the left is a, is a hutong that's been destroyed. It's a several hundred years old and, and sort of making way for the new culture of uh, banal skyscrapers. The other interesting thing to me about China that sort of reinforced what we were doing back here in Los Angeles was the direct connection between architecture and capitalism that since September 11th we had become so um, merged with the culture of capital that there was almost no boundary line between formal differentiation or the sort of tradition of the avant-garde to produce um, a resistance through formal difference or material difference and the environment that capitalism produces, which is an environment of mediated affect. And it was also interesting to me to see a culture that hadn't yet sort of, while they were embracing the sort of green ethos, they hadn't yet actually determined that there were some bad side effects of this and the fact that they're sort of celebrating the national oil company here. It's sort of like being back in the 1950s in the United States or in Europe and seeing um, some of the North Sea uh, British Petroleum exhibitions that were produced in London or closer to home, um, Exxon or Shell Oil uh, for some of the expositions in the United States. What we also found, or I found curious in my travels um, over the last three or four years in China was that while there was a complete participation by the avant-garde or the people that call themselves the avant-garde in architecture, um, and the generation of some beautiful buildings that even I couldn't sort of express uh, dislike of. They're sort of e extravagant, wonderful, beautiful things to see. At the same time, it was slightly disturbing because there was always this uh, hangover or smog that sort of um, 
filtered around all the buildings and wasn't just a sort of physical smog in the nature of environment, but was a smog of paranoia and security. So you had these, these pieces of architecture that 100 years ago would be about sort of celebrating the avant-garde and celebrating democratic freedom and celebrating the sort of possibilities of the new age, and yet we have them locked down under armed guard and these territories are essentially off limits. They become objects within the city. Even Stephen Hull's linked hybrid has a sort of entrance that only certain people are allowed to pass into. If you're deemed um, sort of ineligible to go to the movies or to wander around the landscape, you are essentially um, not able to enter. Finally, I, I think we were sort of disturbed by examining the culture that was making so many sort of technological leaps and so many sort of material and physical progressions in their history, and yet what was resulting was a reincarnation of late 19th century industrial, the late 19th century industrial evolution and um, versions of early 20th century, 21st century, cap I'm sorry, 20th century capitalism uh, without the protections of labor unions or uh, laws. And so we have a sort of culture now that I think, in a way, I'd like to sort of go back to my original um, thesis that I showed in the beginning. In, in a way, Herzog Moron and Hull and, and the other, um, and Rem Koolhaas, they, they actually did, it, did me one better in the sense that they produced real environments in which these, uh, inv these conditions could unfold, sort of proving my point. However, there's hope, and the hope is that within these cities, there exists a centuries-old culture that has dug in so deep and has affected the city fabric so much that it actually taught me some lessons about city making and about uh, sort of humbled me in the way that, you know, I think a lot of you know, Western, Westerners who go east sort of feel humbled by not just the history but the way that people occupy urban space in a different way than, than we as Americans do or as Europeans. And uh, for me, this, these particular images are, are especially um, poignant because they signify a transprogramming of space by the people that is uncontrolled by government agencies and merely exists as a collection of textures, environments, phenomenologies, and activities. Oops. So, our office. Um, we're a fairly new office in the sort of span of geolog uh, geologic time. We are only five years old. Um, we sort of take on the ethos that John Lydon uh, imbued when asked on The Tomorrow Show with Tom Schneider what PIL was. He said, we ain't no band, we're a company. Simple, nothing to do with rock and roll. And what he was trying to do was distance himself from the uh, media frenzy that had surrounded the Sex Pistols and ultimately uh, not just created the downfall of what was punk rock, but also had created a media culture that sought to use the avant-garde, which punk at a certain time was in history, and use it in the name of commerce. And so he was trying to find new methodologies for working within the discipline because he liked being a musician, but he also wanted to try to carve out a new terrain that didn't uh, take all its cues from what um, commercial culture or music culture dictated. And so that was kind of the founding sort of principles in our company. We want to participate in architecture, we believe in architecture, but we do not want to be part of the sort of popular um, star architecture that exists today. And so um, I, I thought when I, was, when I accepted the invitation to this lecture that it would be interesting to look back in an, again, nostalgic fashion and see where the office was and where it is today. And what I thought was interesting, just looking at our Excel spreadsheets, which document our building projects, is that we are a pretty good litmus of how most offices are, in, not just in the United States, but I think in Europe as well. And so you can see in 2006, building commissions were fairly healthy over half the the uh, sort of generative practice in the office and teaching was sort of a healthy balance and research was as well. And then as we move into 2008, as the sort of uh, economy fizzles, things begin to change and teaching gets a little heavier, research gets a little heavier and building commissions get pretty slim. However, we did manage to build some things and produce some things despite the, the uh, 
rapidly decaying economy. We actually broke ground on this project in uh, 2007, and right as the economy was sort of at its tipping point, and we were getting all these reports that banks were failing, and the project was ready to go into foundations, and it's a design-build project, which meant a direct investment. And we decided, what the heck, we've invested so much money in it already, we might as well go forward. And it, it finished completion uh, right as the economy went into the tank in 2008. And the project on the right, of course, is a special project which actually we initiated as a sort of live workspace that the office occupies today, and I have as my home. And it was a sort of prog project that taught us everything we know about architecture and being your own contractor. And so I sort of decided to show it today as a, a kind of, again, self-indulgent sort of look back at, at sort of where we've been. However, despite the, the sort of tremors in the economy, we actually were fortunate enough to participate in a lot of other interesting avenues within architecture, and ones that didn't necessarily involve architects, but got us involved in a lot of fascinating sort of diversions, which fed back into the practice and fed back into our interests in not just critiquing um, sort of cult culture of ornamentation and materiality that was, again, sort of picking up speed since um, the early aughts, but also, you know, exploring the notion of handicrafts and sort of the authentic and what the authentic means in contemporary culture. And so this was a project we undertook with materials and applications and the Danish artist Anja Franke. It's called Igloo. It is actually an igloo made out of felt, so an igloo for Los Angeles, a climate that is inhospitable to um, ice or Arctic terrains. And at the same time, it was intended to be an exploration in sustainable materials. We used bamboo, uh, which was harvested from the LA Arboretum. Uh, we fabricated joints out of uh, welded pieces of uh, recycled metal and duct taped them in place. So probably wouldn't pass a lot of people's standards for uh, what an architectural detail is. But if you can see in the photograph there, they're, they're pretty well done, pretty well wrought. We had good tapers on staff at materials and application who took a lot of time, as long as we didn't feed them too many beers. Um, and then the finished product, which uh, is an interesting, um, evokes an interesting debate because we actually got into a midnight discussion about, you know, what does the vestibule of the igloo look like? What does the form look like? And I, being kind of anti-formalist, sort of said, well, who gives a shit what it looks like? Let's just like make the, the vestibule like the same scale. And we got into a discussion of what happens when you begin to play with scale, play with materiality, what a vestibule means in architecture. Very sort of, uh, I think, arcane talk that, that occurs, but nevertheless made the project. Because what happened is that the vestibule increased in size and ultimately became a sort of doppelganger of the igloo itself and still managed to sort of serve as a kind of circulatory space. So it, as things sort of dried up, we managed to sort of look at our experience mainly with uh, difficult hillside construction and start to use it as a way of exploring other ideas we had in, in practice. And so we came up with a project called the Donut, which was an experimental house uh, that could be adapted for varying steepnesses of slope. And um, then also begin to examine what it means to live in a house in LA because it's different. We, sort of suggested than living in a house in Cleveland or in New Jersey. And what the culture that LA has bred um, means to domesticity. And then of course, what the legacy of modernism is when you're building next to Schindler, uh, Wright, Neutra, Seriano, and Lautner. So this takes us, and I promise I'm not going to continue with this all the way up until 2020. Um, this takes us to the current present, and as you can see now, by 2010, building commissions have pretty much evaporated. Teaching has balanced out, and research is beginning to sort of take back some terrain. We also, also have in the office some really interesting things unfolding, which we didn't have a name for, so we called them urban activism. And I'll, I'll get to that in a bit, but the, the thing that was exciting about this is it generated new production for the office and actually allowed, it, allowed us to sort of practice as architects, though not in ways that we were used to. And so it, as part of that, we, we got to experiment a lot with digital fabrication. We got to explore what it means to make an ergonomic object for the public realm, or not in this case, and what it means to generate um, 
work on sort of formally explicit drawings that relate to the human body, but in the end actually don't necessarily communicate the intent of the object. And so this was a, a project that we produced for Woodbury University for the mock-ups show that they hosted last year. Um, we originally were produce, going to produce a concrete bench. We found that the bench was going to be too heavy, and so we ended up just showing off the formwork, which we then spent a lot more time on and made into a kind of representation of the negative or the object that um, isn't there. And that's what we ended up displaying. Um, another sort of cast off from a project that didn't happen, which I'll go into in a little bit, um, is a uh, different methods of working with concrete formwork and using CNC fabrication to create differentiation on minute scales. I think a lot of the projects that you see that are experimenting with CNC fabrication nowadays in concrete tend to be much larger, so you don't have as many problems with um, vibrating the concrete, air bubbles, uh, contamination of the formwork, things like that. So we were actually interested in what happens when you try to make things something very small and produce something that's using everyday off-the-shelf methods that you get at Home Depot and um, trying to refine that as best we could because that's ultimately the, the client we were producing it for. And so this is the sort of prototype on the right. So now uh, we're here. Um, and urban activism and research is what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, being that this is a school of architecture, I don't really see fitting to talk about my own student work. That's pretty fantastic. Um, the work I'm going to discuss tonight uh, is twofold. It is, on a certain level, um, the research that the office has been engaged in for the past six years, if not longer, really. I've been thinking about it since 2002, after the World Trade Center competition entrants were unveiled. Um, and then on the right, the sort of urban activism that we've been participating in and are continuing to research to some very exciting ends that we're currently engaged in. So I've decided to throw out the lecture title, which was, as Vulcan Alkanoglu pointed out, rather pompous and way too long. I think he sort of made an analogy that it was akin to a Scrabble game. So I have sort of ditched that um, in favor of extra small, small, because that's what the project scales are for tonight. They're of the smallest nature, though we're hoping they have the most resounding effects. So. Um, I'm going to talk about LA tonight. So if, you, if you're really not interested in LA, this is probably going to bore you. But I will be referencing other locales because in my travels as a, as a teacher at Woodbury, I've managed to sort of go to some pretty interesting places, um, many of which I think have been written off as being passe, but have sort of taught me some important lessons in urbanism and ways of dealing with the public space. Um, we will return to California, which is why I'm including this sort of dramatic image on the right. Um, but for right now, we're going to be dealing with Berlin, which is LA's sister city, and talking about how sort of that's sort of influenced some things that we've, we've been implementing here. Um, Berlin, is, as we all know, sort of underwent some dramatic changes in the mid 20th century. Um, and you can sort of see what happens to the avant-garde at a certain point. And what interested us in Berlin was not necessarily this particular thing, but what was left from all that. And we found this to be really interesting because in a city that ultimately people were flocking to and, and a lot of tourists and, and had a lot of focus on its center, unlike a lot of other places, um, the center was oddly empty and there was a lot of space left over. And the space wasn't sort of being held down with barbed wire fences or walls or security guards, but was actually sort of open for anybody to use. And yet it wasn't abused. It wasn't actually sort of infiltrated in a destructive way. It was sort of enjoyed by people in their daily urban life. And so we sort of thought, well, this is interesting. We should begin to sort of catalog this. And yet there were some interesting pop cultural references that came, came out, of, out of the Germans' interest in these negative spaces that either transpired from World War II or the wall. You have here uh, on the right a, a sort of kinder park which has occurred in a space of bombed out, a bombed out building. This is not a real sample of the Berlin Wall. It's actually a Berlin climbing wall. They have a good sense of humor over there. 
Um, and the interesting thing about this particular piece of property is it, I asked some colleagues there about why they had so many of these parks around the city and they said, well, it's because the government doesn't know who the owners are so they can't really figure out what to do with them and so they just turn them over to the public realm and it's temporary, you don't get to keep the park. The park might go away if so-and-so's uh, ancient uh, cousin comes forward and can demonstrate that they have a deed and title to the land and want to build condos there. But at the, at the, the moment in time, the piece of property will be open to all. It will be part of the city fabric, part of its culture and ultimately its history. So back to Los Angeles. Um, we, we, at Urban Operations, we have multiple perceptions of landscape and we think that they differ in many ways from our more prolific colleagues and that's partly because we're, we're a small office. It's just a few of us. I usually have a couple of interns and myself. Occasionally we work with collaborators. So we can't take on things like Fresh Kills or Olympic Sculpture Park or Parc de la Villette. We're limited to a, a very small scale. And so um, we also, in our research, determined that, especially in the economy that we face now, large-scale parks are not appropriate uses of the landscape in today's city. And that's largely because of the amount of resources that they take and the amount of time that they require to develop. And so it has assisted us in developing that as our first precept, so no big parks. It's not that we don't like the Olympic Sculpture Park. We think it's very nice, but at the same time, it, you can't replicate them all over the city, and therefore it becomes a destination rather than a part of the urban fabric. And then, of course, on the left, we have Robin Hood Gardens by the Smithsons, a sort of um, uh, in, intention of architects to sort of try to merge landscape directly with building without uh, understanding that that requires a kind of porosity to it. And I'm, of course, not criticizing the Smithsons for their proposal, but at the same time, understanding the legacy of, of Siam and Team 10 uh, it seems that now we would do things differently. So there's this emergent concept that has been written about in the press that maybe some of you are familiar with, and it's been termed Publoid Spaces by Rowan Moore, who is a, a, a journalist for the UK Guardian. And Publoid Spaces are spaces that are uh, natural landscapes. They're very beautiful. They're very well constructed. But at the same time, they're not public landscapes. They are um, seemingly public. You don't have to go through a gate. You don't have to go through a fence. You don't have to pay for parking. Yet, if you were to wander in there and want to have an Occupy LA or to drag a, a shopping cart, uh, you would be stopped by the guys um, in the slide over here and told to pack off because ultimately it's private property. The corporations that you see here are funding that project and that property and ultimately have the last say on who goes there. For those of you who have practiced in New York or spent time there, you're familiar with a lot of the zoning laws that were introduced in the 70s that have been critiqued since that have demonstrated public spaces where you might, a developer might give over a courtyard to public use, but that courtyard might be surrounded by a building up three floors basically controlled by secu a security apparatus that, do that does not allow true urbanism to occur. So therefore, at Urban Operations, we um, don't see ourselves as landscape urbanists because we're not landscape architects. We have no experience with large-scale ecosystems, and it would be irresponsible of us to try to engage in that. And we don't see ourselves as tactical urbanists because we think things should be a bit more permanent than yarn bombing. Uh, and so we've sort of lighted on the term of embedded urbanists. And this takes cues from the US military, of course, with the boots on the ground concept and that you can um, sort of do all the surveillance and, and uh, satellite analysis you want, but ultimately the most successful campaign occurs when you have people on the ground doing real time reconnaissance and feeding that back into the system. And then, of course, we do appreciate the sort of uh, specif site specificity of the yarn bombers and the temporality of it, so we, we sort of have a nod to that as well. We prefer in our landscape projects to cultivate textures, edges, and porous taxonomies in order to produce phenomenological environments rather than focusing on topological surfaces alone, formal geometries alone, or parametric complexity. And 
the embedded urbanist does not eschew technology. We are very familiar with GIS. We appreciate it. We are very familiar with software. We appreciate it. But we're not completely seduced by it either. And like the US Special Forces who are well equipped with their information, we want to be there on the site to actually see what's going on. We want to feel what it's like to sit on the surface that we're uh, dealing with and understand what those phenomenological and humanistic qualities are. And we want to talk to people to find out what they think of the site we're uh, trying to design for. So, one of the big problems that we've noticed because the economy has tanked and that there aren't that many building commissions, especially among people my age, is that a lot of us have tapped into the same idea. Landscape um, type projects are all over the place. If you go online or, or visit some of the RFP sites, you'll find that there's a lot of invitations to submit proposals that don't require a landscape architect. And so for you know, people who are in practice that are looking for design opportunities, these are very fertile grounds. However, the problem that we've identified with most architects is that when uh, we as a profession get involved in landscape without consulting a landscape architect, we tend to do things like this. And I'm not bashing Richard Serra on purpose. It just was the easiest image to sort of deal with where you have a kind of inhumane surface that people have to traverse. You have a sterile water element and an equally sterile splice of landscape. It's sort of like oregano on top of a pizza. And so what that forms is an environment that no one really wants to spend time in, that they generally just move from one end to the other. This is kind of how we'd like to see it. We'd actually like to make things difficult, and we'd like to make the architecture disappear a little bit. So when we're proposing things, typically there's very little architecture. We're interested in surface only. So we found, or I found in my travels again to, to Berlin, that um, architects have been doing this for a long time, as I'm sure a lot of you know. And one of the architects that I think has done this most adeptly is Carl Friedrich Schinkel. And he also underscores the current uh, I think disagreement between architects and landscape architects and, and that he collaborated on the gardens of Sans Souci with uh, Joseph Lenné, but in the end um, Joseph Lenné uh, refused to speak to him after a certain point because Schinkel was actually taking over as the landscape designer for the uh, immediate environments around his buildings. And so for us the Charlottenhof, which is in the Sans Souci um, uh, complex is essentially really fascinating because it's, it's a, a simple expression of surface, a porosity, and a, a weave of that within an architectural partie that ends up producing a project that is spatially stronger because of that um, relationship. And I, I like to actually suggest that Schinkel is the original topologist and that he took a rather banal landscape that um, Linné had deftly designed to be kind of an expression of perfect balance between human control and natural control. And he then um, scooped up the landscape and folded it into his building, which itself was an adaptive reuse project, um, in order to make uh, a much more efficient project and ultimately a much more um, enjoyable experience. So, Taking all that into account, we've allowed that to sort of seep into our consciousness in the way that we understand landscape within the city. And again, I'm going to be talking about Los Angeles tonight. And so the projects that we've undertaken have almost no architecture, but they do have architectural space. And through very careful analysis and very simple maneuvers, we've managed to create spaces that have captured um, spaces back from the city that are forgotten, they don't show up on GIS, and have managed to turn those back into spaces for the neighborhoods to enjoy on a localized level, meaning that the pedestrian is served rather than sort of larger constituency that's arriving by automobile. In fact, most people drive past us at 50 miles an hour on their way to work in the morning on Silver Lake Boulevard. And this is how most of these sites that we found that we are referring to as hybrid sites, start, or hybrid infrastructure, I'm sorry, started out. <laughs> 
Um, this slide uh, shows what the site looked like before in Google Maps and on the ground. Um, it basically was uh, what the city refers to as a parkway extension, meaning they just capped a turn lane and, and then in order to deal with it, um, sort of folded the sidewalk around it to create a, a sterile space that um, ultimately had no function or benefit to the neighborhood. And we produced through no real um, forms of avant-garde analysis a project that was incredibly simple and that we um, first recognized that you needed to protect people from the virtual freeway that was next door to the site. And so we created a berm here and then used the space from the, that we sort of had left from the berm to create a, a public uh, seating area that formed essentially multiple edges on the site. So you have a kind of soft edge here that allows pedestrians who are moving from this area down to the bus stops this way um, to have some sort of enjoyment. And then if they want to stop and phone a friend or hang out, they can do that here, but not for any length of time because one of the things that we found with any kind of advocacy is that there's a lot of voices and most people like parks, but they don't want them in front of their houses because they're worried largely about the homeless. And so we, um, after wrestling with um, Department of Transportation over the bench that you saw earlier, gave up and decided that we would um, do boulders instead, which make for great sitting benches but um, aren't good for sleeping on. So that was the sort of compromise. What we found out with boulders was that the city actually doesn't like boulders because people can hide behind them when they're in a shootout with LAPD. And my comments uh, almost verbatim to the Bureau of Engineering official that I was meeting with was, you mean like a shootout is in John Wayne in the Wild West? And he said, yes, it's happened. People hide behind them and shoot at the cops. And I said, well, okay, we'll do small boulders. So um, what we, we ultimately arrived at was a kind of slice of the natural landscape within Los Angeles. Because uh, if any of you worked on public projects, you know that, again, those voices can be rather cacophonous at times and actually drive the design into um, a level of banality that ultimately no one's proud of. And so when we had some pushback from the neighborhood, we said, you know what, we're not doing design here. We are producing a slice of the native Southern California landscape. It's like we took a spoon, went out to the hinterlands and brought back a giant piece of it. So, and here it is. And so the slides that we have on the, the left-hand side are taken over the past uh, few years since the park was produced. And this is the other great thing about engaging in landscape projects. As soon as you do a building, the building begins to decay. But when you do a landscape project, it continues to blossom and grow almost like a person. And so it's just really beautiful in a sense because it, every time you visit your site, instead of looking at things going, well, now I have to fix that stucco detail or there's water dripping down the facade of the building, you can now celebrate the fact that people are hanging out, um, the plants are doing well, and uh, it's better than when you left it. So th the growth, what also surprised us and sort of got us more interested in these projects because at the time we hadn't intended to actually engage directly in landscape. We, we just were doing it as a kind of um, service to the neighborhood. What we learned was that these landscapes actually begin to grow as, as organisms unto themselves and that they start to sort of break out of the designed plans that you produce and produce their own ecosystems that are completely unpredictable for what you might have um, considered with your planting plan. And so what we have now is lavender seeding itself and growing naturally as it would in the wild. We have um, uh, jacaranda trees, which are sort of aggressively attempting to grow new jacaranda trees. And things are beginning to take off two years later. And we've gone from sort of this, which is the construction of the berm, which was done by the community with the architect serving as a kind of um, contractor to this, which is beginning to get to a point where it's actually becoming real urban space. And so again, this is kind of what it looked like just after the opening, and this is what it looks like now. So it, it really is like a living organism, literally, and it's, it's something that uh, we started to get excited about because it opened up new avenues for us to experiment within uh, our practice. So one more. <laughs>
And then you get the satisfaction of seeing your project on Google Maps. So, so taking all this into account, um, after the project was complete, it, it took from 2008 to 2010. It's, um, like any pro building project, it takes a lot of time and meetings uh, with the city and, and the constituency that you're involved in. And then construction was um, a six month process, um, every Saturday for six months. And so after that, we're sort of like, well, what can we do with this experience? Because we've, we've uh, learned a lot about landscape. We understand that it's a culture that produces architectural space and phenomenological space. Um, and it's, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of possibilities out there. So what do we do with that? And so we went back to looking at um, experience in Berlin and Nanjing and looking at how that culture could begin to be used as a a conceptual driver for other landscape projects, not just in Los Angeles, but around the country. So just to sort of give the narrative behind this, this is a street in Nanjing where um, you have an area that's designated by texture for bicycles that are removed from the street. You have sort of an uh, area where people sell birds informally. It's not sanctioned by the government. And all that, that really took to uh, instigate that is some barbed wire between these trees, the trees themselves, some seating elements, some tables. And it, it formed a sort of space that people could hang out in that um, was as, in many ways, interesting as a building. The other image is, of course, the Berlin Wall Zone. Now, um, uh, in 2010, people sort of occupying it um, without any sort of designed elements. So uh, we began to enter competitions for landscape. And one of those competitions was in uh, Waltham, Mass Waltham, Massachusetts, um, called, it was a, a project that called for a small urban park um, to overwrite the existing urban park that had been designed in the 70s and was using more concrete than anything else. And the people were looking for a landscape that could be sort of activated, could serve as a threshold between the historical theater, which was at the back, and the busy shopping street that was starting to sort of become gentrified on the um, um, the other uh, street of the project. So we actually began to take a little more time. We had much more. Um, resources in the office to engage in this in a more critical level and examine what it meant to design um, a, a piece of landscape when you ultimately had an existing urban context that came, uh, sort of transmitted a big history, but also um, was in a way a tabula rasa, it was a sort of throwaway landscape that um, the city didn't want, they didn't want any preservation of it, and so we um, only preserved cues that we thought were successful. So we instigated a series of drawings that uh, sought to explore all the possibilities of the site. And so they dealt with uh, different architectural components like limits, edges, surfaces, datums, textures, you know, all in familiar architectural lingo, densities, using different densities of trees, atmospheres, because atmosphere is one of the key components of both architecture and landscape, and then the park proposal itself, which this is the sort of finished schematic that we presented to the community. Um, part of the component was a public art project. Uh, as we showed with Richard Serra, we're sort of skeptical of public art. A lot of it is bad. There are some great examples of it out there, but um, a lot of the stuff that gets done in the mainstream is, is pretty bad. So we were trying to figure out, well, what can we do so we can put all the resources we have into the landscape portion of the project and as little as possible into the public art, even though we're the instigators of that, that uh, component. So what we came up with was called Flickr Field, and it was uh, taking used or uh, recycled um, pole vaulting poles and creating, um, using the sort of datum drawing that I showed earlier, a field of these static elements that because of their um, uh, tinsel qualities would actually begin to sort of sway in the wind and um, behave like trees even though they were kind of artificial elements. And they would act as a grounding device for the project, direct you through the project. But also um, what we did was recognize that, well, there needs to be some bling there because otherwise people are never going to go for this. So what we did was coat the tops of the poles with intumescent paint so that at night um, the car lights of the passing streets would illuminate them as in, in a road and um, create a, a series of effects that would be filtered by the birch trees that were our primary planting element in the project. And that was, primary, that was, that was important for us because birch trees um, have a presence all year round. They are incredibly hardy and um, they generate different kinds of densities and seed themselves quite well and operate um, in different levels of canopy. So that to us was, you know, 
sectionally very interesting. So this is a section of the project. Um, it's a very narrow project, so you know it's very just it's just really a pass through. So you can see the sort of birch trees merging with the poles, and then at night we have. Um, the sort of flicker field, which if it was a windy condition, these would move back and forth and, and create a moray pattern. And then this is the sort of standard sort of civic images that you generate for a project of this type to sort of convince people that yes, this could be real, you do want this. And so here's some more images. So that actually led us to do um, and participate in several other competitions, one of which was to sort of just occurred here in Los Angeles. And uh, we were quite familiar with the typology, again, this hybrid infrastructure, these spaces that the city had forgotten about that were the remnants of uh, Bureau of Engineering and Department of Transportation's exploits into the urban realm. And we um, sort of entered this public competition with the idea that we would not just explore um, our interest in landscape here, but also try to expand into some more projective um, components to the project that involves sort of fabrication and try to create those objects that, that every sort of landscape project uh, needs now to sort of be successful in a civic realm. So again, trying to figure out what's the most minimal thing we can produce that will disappear and ultimately allow the landscape to conquer it. For us, that was a pot. We knew it had to be an interesting pot. And so we, we worked on generating a textured pot that was a uh, representation of Silver Lake um, geography. And also with the notion that these pots would be um, sort of manicured by the uh, fabrication process in order to resist graffiti and, and, and also in order to collect moss and moisture and then allow for the plants to grow in a controlled way because this was a much more heavily trafficked area than the Parkman Triangle Park that we showed earlier. So again, you know, we embarked on a series of exploratory drawings dealing with the tabula rasa, exploring different movement patterns. Um, we went with a very sort of traditional uh, parti in the sense we looked at civic parks throughout history and determined that what's interesting about the sort of cruciform pattern is that people like to sort of meet each other and a cruciform pattern is the most successful way of um, guaranteeing that. It also corresponded to several different modes of sort of travel that we had identified on the site, both between the bus um, system and the sort of hipsters that sort of populate the Silver Lake area. And then of course we sort of, in order to implement our uh, piece of urban furniture, gridded out the site in different ways um, dealt with a landscape, um, trying to sort of create differentiation that would not just um, create a singular space, but create pockets of space so that people would linger, would participate in a kind of, sort of urban narrative, meet um, new friends, and generally use the space as a respite from the sort of blistering um, traffic, barrage of traffic on Sunset and Santa Monica Boulevards. So again, you can't do this many pots, it's too much, right? It's always that aesthetic discussion of how much is too much, and for us, this was just enough. Um, we then again played with the landscape, raising certain elements to um, create shelter for people, as we did in the first project, and uh, try to create not just sort of physical differentiation, but also um, differentiation in the way that people could occupy the site. And so then we added, of course, some amenities like bike, bike uh, sort of parking and a lemonade stand and a lemon, it was a lemon grove and things like that. And that's the park. So, and then this is the sort of prototypes that were generated for that. And so we were pretty, we were pretty happy with it. It seemed like a nice balance between architecture and landscape and we didn't win. But at the same time, it, it again was a, a good lesson in sort of what these types of sites represent and how architects, again, not landscape architects, but architects could actually participate in this exciting new discourse within uh, urban design. And we found that uh, around, the more we sort of noticed these sites, we, we found that there was a, a commonality between them and that they were fairly close together, usually separated by no more than 10 minutes, and that um, th we could use the same strategies we employed with the Parkman Triangle project that I showed you in the very beginning. Um, in order to alter the landscape. Yet these sites also posed a really interesting dilemma in the fact that with Parkman Triangle, which is bounded on all sides by the public realm, some of these sites were bounded 
not just by uh, sort of private infrastructure or private commercial um, sites, but they were also um, bounded by multiple lanes of traffic with no circulation. And in some cases, there was nothing there at all, just space. But the more we got into this and the more we inquired at the city, the more we found it was really fascinating because there is no information on this. There are a lot of people out there um, all over the world doing these types of projects, but in Los Angeles, these, pro these types of sites don't exist. You can queue in as much information you want into GIS and there will be no um, data coming back to you. In fact, the city has um, only now begun to catalog the existing median sites and uses the terminology um, of north by northwest, central median, corner of Silver Lake and Parkman, not something that you could enter into a GIS database very readily. And so um, we found these very interesting because they actually escape a lot of the computational methods many um, architects and um, sort of landscape architects are starting to use with regards to GIS and, and parametric urbanism. So we sort of were like, well, this, this kind of hybrid infrastructure, these dark matter spaces are really interesting because they don't, they don't actually exist in the city's lingo. And in fact, the city doesn't allow you to really call them parks because they, if they have to tear them up, they will tear them up without any sort of recompense. They are merely pieces of temporal infrastructure in the city. So this is our constituency that we were dealing with. And, and it's in um, Silver Lake uh, Neighborhood Council, I'm sorry, Silver Lake uh, City Council District 13. Um, LA, for those of you who aren't that familiar with the city, is broken up into different kinds of pol political constituencies. And um, Silver Lake, because it's local for my office and my home, tended to be the easiest because it was right there. And it also is one of the oldest sections in the city, meaning that it had a lot of these very odd infrastructural mistakes or leftovers for us to examine. And so we began to sort of drive around and also look at using satellite imagery, uh, again, that combinatorial method of, of analysis. And we found all these other sites that were within Silver Lake. And we sort of said, well, if, if they're there, if there are sites there, I bet there are other sites that are adjacent to them that we missed. And we could keep going with this sort of diagram uh, into infinity and probably find that one wouldn't have to walk, walk, walk more than five minutes and they'd be at one of these potential sites. So for constituency one, which is the uh, datum of Silver Lake Boulevard, uh, we opted to examine uh, three different sites. And I'm gonna talk about just very briefly two of those. And in this constituency, we found that these sites were not only on major bus lines that connected with rail transit, meaning that, again, we are serving the pedestrians as our primary client and the local neighborhood. We are not driving to these things. They exist as parts of the urban fabric. Um, we sort of identified these as being potential, a potential case study that we could undergo and then present to the city. And after talks with the city council, they were sort of very excited about this, especially since the mayor is unveiling new ways of dealing with the urban um, sort of pocket parks now that the economy has put a hold on large scale urban interventions like the Sunset uh, Freeway Park that's, or the Downtown Freeway Park that had been talked about. So again, these sort of isolated constituencies, um, the methods of operation because of budget concerns uh, are fairly simple, they involve different kinds of textures, again, so we're using um, here um, concrete coring systems to drill through the existing uh, asphalt substrate and allow plants to grow. We were using, uh, pr proposing uh, concrete uh, sort of um, etching machines or concrete carving machines um, in order to create textures that would allow water runoff to channel into planting beds. And then in order to create um, textural differentiation for Accessibility, we are using, of course, um, international accessibility uh, material standards, not just as a way of um, tipping our hat to the Americans with Disability Act, but also trying to create a kind of visual texture as well. And so um, this is, and this is, this project is literally weeks old, so the, the drawings are very rudimentary. Um, this is one of our first constituencies, and it was uh, the the median strip that I showed you earlier. 
Um, it's now been turned into a pocket park that involves additional parking by turning the road into a one-way street, providing bike parking um, over here. And uh, again, you know, the operative uh, language of architects in this case, because the budgets are extremely slim, are um, boulders, not of a, over a certain size, um, berms, plantings, um, textures, and then uh, trees to create phenomenological effects. And so um, this is a kind of general section um, that demonstrates kind of what we're beginning to examine. And again, our, our sort of optimism is that if this project is successful and goes forward, that this will be more like what you see in sort of um, the coming years in Los Angeles and that you won't have to walk more than five to 10 minutes to have a, a space that allows you an escape from the urban environment. So we're gonna shift tact here. Um, I'm almost at an hour, but I think I can cover the rest fairly quickly. So hopefully no one has any pressing commitments. Um, in 2001, when I was a student, thesis student here, um, I got up just like everybody else and came to school to go to work in studio. Um, one of our pastimes as students here was to stand outside and to watch the 747 circle around downtown Los Angeles. It's probably a pastime that still exists here, something to do. You're also kind of amazed that they let them fly that close. And of course, we all know what happened. Uh, school was canceled. A lot of us uh, sort of went home, called friends and relatives on the East Coast. And there was this moment where architecture actually took a pause. And then resumed things as usual. And what was interesting to me as both a student and as a sort of emerging practitioner was that this something seemed horribly wrong with the way that this was being dealt with and that the sort of enthusiasm that the architectural avant-garde, people that I looked up to as a student, people whose writings I read in theory classes and um, went to see stand up here or in the sort of variation of here at Beethoven Street or in the tent, um, these people who were leaders within the architectural community seemed to be making some horrible errors in judgment. And so out of that, after some recollection and the arrival of the, the uh, World Trade Center competition and the results, which were, I think most people agree, incredibly disappointing, out of that evolved what we at Urban Operations developed as the story of the plane. And the story of the plane evolved out of the psychological trauma of 9-11, specifically as a critique of the political paranoia, the xenophobia that followed the fall of the World Trade Towers, and most importantly, the nihilistic response fostered by the architectural community for Ground Zero, which was steeped in the guise of post-criticality. And the architects participating in the competition to rebuild Ground Zero, which included luminaries such as Peter Eisenman, FOA, Greg Lynn, and of course, Daniel Liebskin, demonstrated such a lack of, I don't wanna use creativity, but um, daring in their attempts to reconcile the sociocultural event of 9-11, as well as the Twin Towers position within Lake Capital, that we felt that a critical project exploring these themes as well as the culture of celebrity in contemporary design discourse was necessary. And of course, this was a few years after Frank Gehry completed Bilbao and we were beginning to sort of talk about the Bilbao effect, which is now, I think most people would agree, defunct. So I wanna actually take a moment to quote Reinhold Martin here who influenced a lot of the, the research that I did on the World Trade Center towers and the sort of culture of architecture that surrounded the competition. And this is, uh, was published in the Harvard Design Reader in 2005. And he says, as an architect, I am well aware of the very real difficulties of actually practicing architecture and getting paid for it, while voicing even the most mild of objections. Thus, the usual response is this. Architecture is, in any case, so thoroughly disempowered, so culturally marginal, as to render any critique from within its walls, so to speak, ineffectual 
if not entirely irrelevant. And he was echoing the comments of George Baird, who, again, I'll quote by, this is telling me to shut up. Um, it is clear that a projective architecture will not be able to be developed in the absence of a supporting body of projective theory. Without it, I predict that this new architecture will devolve into merely pragmatic and too merely decorative and with astonishing speed. And I think that both he and Reinhold Martin, um, having a certain educated perspective, were probably right if we look back at the images that I showed from uh, Beijing, the Beijing Olympics and the Shanghai Expo. But you can't entirely blame them. This was a culture that was stewing since early modernism. It was a culture that was looking away from an involvement with civic realm, an involvement with politics, and seeking to use capitalism as a way of founding not only new um, types of architecture, but new material effects as well. And what we found to be interesting is that by the time we get to 2002, this is proliferated into a complete moral ambivalence. But that starts out, as I said much earlier, and we have um, on the left, Minoru Yamasaki, um, looking down at the World Trade Center towers in a space that he had specifically um, allocated so that he could stand on a ladder and look to see what they looked like from an airplane. And then, of course, Meese and Philip, who are in many ways responsible for the initial chapter. And we found that these individuals in their legacies produced enough fodder for projects that could become critical and could generate a body politic within architecture, not through um, generating more visual materiality, but actually trying to propose alternatives and suggestions about how architecture could find its way out of the rather vicious trap that it had gotten itself into. What was interesting to us also about the World Trade Center was at the time of its completion in 1973, Super Studio, the last of the sort of architectural utopian thinkers, was producing their work of supersurface. And this to us was interesting because as you have sort of pragmatism, extreme pragmatism on the right, a complete trampling of the civil rights of the populace of a city, you have a complete idealism on the left, something that was propagated out of the revolutions of 68, but was running aground against the hard economics of the 70s and um, a disinterest that was beginning to take shape among, um, amid sort of the architectural establishment. But you have to go back, as I said, even further than that and start with Mies. Mies is the ultimate, as Reinhold Martin has pointed out, he's the ultimate sort of seducer. He's the one who first proposed to us that the skyscraper was not sort of heavy condition within the city that ultimately subtracted space from the civic realm and gave back to it nothing but ephemerality and privatized space. But Mies suggested that this could be a new typology that would ultimately save not just the city but architectural architecture itself because when one cannot generate a project one can at least generate studies in materiality. The problem with Mies, as we've noted, is that the avant-garde has become so popular and overused that you can now have Mies's combo sandwich, as I like to call this, being generated on the Friedrichstrasse in Berlin in 2010 on the very exact site that Mies originally proposed his avant-garde solution. So most people would say that this is an indicator that any sort of resistance is futile and that um, any attempts at a critical project, if we are to believe uh, pragmatists, is irrelevant to the practice of architecture or to the evolution of the discourse. And in a certain degree, one could argue that the skyscraper is fairly used up as a creative medium. Um, however, in searching for our typology to use as an analog in the event of September 11th, we were sort of presented with two um, possibilities. One which is, of course, the MAT building. This is Microsoft's data center, um, which provides uh, hosting for their cloud computing service. And then the other is, of course, 
continuing the project of verticality uh, to infinitum until a critical conclusion is reached or we die trying. And this is, of course, Trump's proposed tower for the Wilshire Corridor on the site of the Ambassador Hotel in 1990. You can imagine what the scalar repercussions would be. This was um, something like, uh, I don't remember, 112 stories or something like that. And while the warehouse or mat typology is certainly the choice, we felt that, again, the skyscraper is capital's touchstone for marketing and all things having to do with urbanism. And by employing all of consumer cultural's nominal cues, physical visibility, technical complexity, and economic exclusivity, the skyscraper is the last overtly visual territorialization of democratic space. This is because we now exist in a totally mediated environment, one where the virtual has trumped the physical, at least where communication is concerned. With regards to media culture that is propagated within sort of our urban centers and in architectural culture as well, the skyscraper has managed to encapsulate the complex physical and technical programs into its envelopes. It's how we got CCTV, while remaining infrastructurally flexible, which is one Wilshire on the right. And beyond it lies the internet, an infinite space where the skyscraper has managed to house everything programmatic at least, as well. For those of you who aren't familiar with One Wilshire, it is where the internet comes in from the Pacific Rim into Los Angeles and is a rather banal building by Skidmore Owings Merrill that was never fully occupied but is now completely occupied by uh, data servers for a large agglomeration of companies and communications networks. The skyscraper, I think for my generation at least, Generation X, holds the primary place in our pop cultural memory. Its lack of initial spatial coherence made it the perfect subject for Frederick Jameson's essay on the, the, and description on post-modernity and the proliferation of what he called hyperspace. And likewise, its inbred stylistic taxonomy has the potential to transcend logic and reason and still instill fear when its visual presence is linked to traumatic events. The image on the right is Gelatin's Bee Thing, which they produced in the World Trade Center Towers in 2000 as part of the uh, sort of Port Authority's um, artist in residence. And it actually was an inspiring project to us because it was one of the first examples we'd seen of a culture of hacking going on within um, the, the skyscraper, especially one as iconic and um, sort of uh, world-renowned as the World Trade Towers. And what Gelatin did, just to sort of go into detail briefly, is they did or did not, because it's never been confirmed, um, they engineered and built a platform which, after removing the window on the 91st floor of their art space in one of the Twin Towers, they extended this platform several feet out into thin air, and then for 10 minutes allowed a select few um, friends and family to go out onto this platform and experience what it was like to be suspended in space um, outside of one of the largest buildings on Earth. And of course, this was their larger art project, and so there's never been any real confirmation, and yet they produced a documentation which has only been uh, archived in a small book form that you can buy, and then through the photograph, which I'm showing on the right. The other thing that we find interesting about the skyscraper is that it captures the imagination from a technical standpoint and a programmatic standpoint as well. It's been thoroughly uh, explored with regards to the way it, it can be exploited as a piece of transportation or as a piece of um, as Rumquas would put it, uh, culture, the, sort of a piece that would um, embolize the culture of congestion. And here is an example of um, 1970s planning that was produced for uh, a skyscraper project in order to maximize the number of desks that they could fit into one space. <clears throat> 
But I promised that we were going to stick with the local. So um, despite all the development going on elsewhere, we're going to stay in LA. And that is still going to keep us in touch with global politics in the way that the skyscraper has not only influenced, but influ been influenced by those, those uh, global politics. And I'm going to present some projects that are my research on the skyscraper typology and the sort of critical project that we're trying to construct. What we found to be interesting about Los Angeles when we looked for subjects for our skyscraper um, study is that due to long mutations in LA zoning code, they've produced several interesting case studies that exist both um, as land use, uh, examples of land use, but also as uh, programmatic uses and architectural parties. In addition, LA's reluctance to claim vertical territory has resulted in some very interesting material constructs from the filigree to the fractured. And finally, the city's modernist roots and rampant thirst for growth, for thirst for growth excuse me, coupled with a high visibility of its urban parcels, have delivered a legacy of buildings with designs which lean towards iconographic, yet because of the sheer scale of Los Angeles slip anonymously into the larger urban fabric as nothing more than banal extrusions of the jumbled mess of LA's commercial strips. However, we have gained and found some projective possibilities in the skyscraper typologies in Los Angeles, stunted as they might be. And this has given way to four proposals, the most recent of which is still underway. We have long been interested in the zine culture that's not just proliferated in architecture, but served in um, alter alternative music culture as a way of social networking prior to cell phones, Facebook, and the internet. And so for us, the zine uh, was the most logical form of production that our office could engage in in order to document these projects. And this is because uh, the zine, on a certain level, I think, again, for Gen Xers, holds a kind of nostalgic value. I think a lot of us who are into um, not punk rock, really, but um, you know, alternative music found solace in these kind of little magazines that ultimately were self-produced, usually of low grade quality and easily portable. And so we found that these would be sort of acceptable mediums with which to work. They also, of course, for everyone gathered here, have a legacy within architectural culture that extends a long way back to where architects were still trying to sort of figure out where the discipline was going rather than accepting the status quo. And so these, these little zines that we produced, we, we wrestled with the idea that would we go digital or would we go physical? And we decided that they needed to be read as both a physical archaeology as well as um, digital ephemera. And so the way that these projects have uh, unfolded is that we have every September 11th, um, generally every other year, produced one of these zines and mailed it out to a select number of people so that they can kind of read it and engage in the project. And then um, after a certain period of time, we post a digital PDF online so that people can download it around the world. And we also began to prescribe certain uh, variables or parameters that would allow us to use this in productive ways. Because we found that digital culture, while incredibly uh, efficient with regards to generating new visual material, actually is really lousy at generating an archive. And so we wanted to actually be able to sort of track these things and um, have them in a few years and figure out what, if they still had any substance. And also, um, we feel at Urban Operations that, that sort of generating physical content is an important aspect of practice still, despite the fact we all use computers in our office, because it allows one to inter interrogate the object as it exists in physical time and space, and not just on a digital device, because for many of these projects that um, you want to look at online, the problem is they're not supported in this operating or that operating system, and so we were falling back onto a universal medium, the physical zine. So for each project, they embody our view that the skyscraper holds a vast and untapped potential to be transformed from a space of capital into a space of urban democratization.
And as I said earlier, most, moreover, each project is leveled as a critique at the architectural establishment who has give, were given the, when given the option to take a unified philosophical stance against the wait, wasteful explosion of vertical architecture that has occurred since 9-11, mostly in Southeast Asia and the Mideast, chose instead to embrace complicity and participate in an orgy of visual and formal excesses that may have generated the largest supply of privatized space in modernity's history, most of which was done on the backs of underpaid and legally unprotected migrant workers. So the first skyscraper we examined was in 2005, and it goes back to that sort of strange LA typology. The zines have over their development maintained the same structure. They feature a kind of manifesto at the beginning which lays out the sort of philosophical strategy. They have a guest critic who usually supplies their own view of what the skyscraper's role in culture is about. Those, those views go on unedited and are generally inserted directly into the zine to allow an alternate space for reflection. I've taken them out tonight so that I don't just show walls of text. Um, but this first project was particularly interesting to us because by 2005, there was a culture of mourning that had surpassed just what um, a general populace or a culture might uh, embrace within history and had risen to a fever pitch, largely because of the mismanagement of the Ground Zero project, and had become a national ethos that resulted us to the United States entering two unnecessary wars. And so for us, the first most logical project was to design a space for the dead within the city, a space that calcified all of the commercial aspects that come along with or associated with dying now. I was just reading an article in the LA Magazine from a year or two ago about the sort of mortuary culture and the sort of, um, sort of way it's structured within Los Angeles and other places now. You take out loans in advance to sort of secure yourself a position in a cemetery to secure your loved ones the sort of easiest path of travel to getting you into the ground or out of sight. And we were interested um, in finding skyscraper typology that either could be generated or could be found within the city. And we didn't have to look far because LA has a lot of dead skyscrapers. And these skyscrapers are partially injected with uh, commercial occupancy, but for the most part, you know, fairly empty. They are remnants from a 1950s modernist period of expansion along Wilshire Boulevard and in Hollywood. And they um, all look pretty much the same in that they have a kind of uh, very um, enclosed lobby. They have a parking skirt, usually about two stories, and then a very generic Mies-inspired modernist facade that has been stripped of all uh, innovation and imaginative ornament to be rendered as a banal extrusion of the city grid. And we used this opportunity to explore the concept of death within digital culture and what happens to people when they die in, in the age of the internet. And the generator for this idea was, of course, Forest Lawn, which if you've been to Forest Lawn, it has no tombstones outside of the sort of celebrity section of the, the project. And it, it ultimately is a generic modernist rendering of what the cemetery is in contemporary culture. At the same time, Forest Lawn was interesting because people go there to convene with the dead, but also to have picnics and to use it as a park space. So we were kind of like, well, this is very interesting. People are actually doing recreational activities here. These girls who are standing on the, the left um, were in the midst of a kickball game while their parents lounged after a picnic. And so again, we, we chose these sort of banal skyscrapers as our sites and thought, well, what happens in contemporary culture when you die? Um, when in the age of, at that time, uh, MySpace and now Facebook, um, what happens to your memory? What happens to all those bits? And so we sort of embraced Warhol's 15 Minutes of Fame and the culture of uh, digital facades that was just becoming sort of um, gaining rampant use, with it, not just within architecture projects on Wall Street, but also in Asia and Europe and uh, sort of said, well, let's have a memory wall so that the entire city can see these people and celebrate them, but only for 15 minutes. 
Um, of course, this being a skyscraper, space is a, a map, you know, it's a, a priority um, and a premium, so you can't have a cemetery plot, you only get an urn. It's delivered from the basement because they don't have enough room on each floor. This is a typical elevation of what these skyscrapers would look like. Um, again, not doing any major treatments to the facade other than adding liquid crystal displays. Parking skirt is maintained, as is the sort of weird lobby. And then, um, as I showed earlier, this is the typical back of many of these skyscrapers since they face residential neighborhoods. And the plan, the program for the, the project um, was quite simple. Um, you would have a, a motor court, shopping lobby, resident delivery. Um, you'd have an administration pl level plan, reservations and check-in, guest records, and of course a little bit of nature in case you need to escape and smoke a cigarette or admiring the surrounding city. Um, but after that, things diverge and the project begins to take its cues from uh, the world order of capitalism. And so depending on what kind of package you buy, you're ushered into different floors. Higher floors, of course, get the are more expensive packages and have the nicer rooms. Um, and they would get sort of leather bound blob ar architecture and seating arrangements. Whereas the uh, Povera package would get you um, sort of acrylic seating on lower floors um, and no concierge service and um, very little amenities. And this is the sort of images. And so, um, again, this was a starting point for us. We found that after this project was concluded, that it actually was the beginning chapter of something much larger, and that we had a lot of um, new terrain to explore. So we very shortly after that began studying other patterns of development in the city, and LA by this time had evolved into um, a much more developed city. Downtown was finally being recognized as the loft mecca that it had always been touted as being. And people were moving downtown from other places, some places where they were used to living in small, tight urban spaces, others where they probably weren't. And that moving into an 800 square foot loft when you had a 1200 square foot um, apartment in Reseda probably was going to be a bit of a shock. So we um, began to look at other typologies around the world and found that uh, this idea of mini storage in high rises was um, a very poignant and uh, fertile ground for study. And one of our favorites is the Day and Meyer Murray and Young warehouse where the rich have been storing their goods in portal vaults for almost a century. And so um, we sort of thought about that and said, well, well, what would the average loft dweller in Los Angeles that might occupy a skyscraper want? And we determined that they would want a lot of space to store their stuff, not on site, because then they would have to live with it. And then they would also want parking because downtown, as it's developed, has developed outside of, in many cases, the zoning code, and thus people don't have anywhere to park. And a lot of people are still new to this urban lifestyle in downtown, and so they want to have a car so they can drive to the valley or the west side or somewhere that's not serviced by um, rapid regional transit. So for us, the most logical skyscraper typology to produce for downtown was not kind of glamorous commercial uh, project, but a 75-story parking garage. And this parking garage, I'll just wait for this person to move their model. You can read the text. It's always better, it's like ripping a Band-Aid off. You just want to go through fast. You don't, you don't want to do it slowly because it just exacerbates the problem. Um, anyway, what we realized about downtown at the time was that downtown LA didn't need more concert halls, art museums, et cetera. It needed more parking because people were having a hard time parking. Anyone who had been down here at, at SciArc at the time, you could find parking anywhere. And now, um, from what I've heard, outside of the building, it's quite difficult. And we also were interested in the skyscraper It's not being a piece of architecture, but being a piece of infrastructure, in that when you move away from the traditional norms of the skyscraper as a kind of um, urban icon or a commercial space, um, you get into some very interesting terrain. And we found that in the culture of mini storage and parking garages, a lot of interesting terrain gets covered that's not intended by the programming. 
And so we began to, t to propose in the skyscraper that it inverts the traditional capitalist model that you find in skyscrapers and that in any sort of normal skyscraper, the higher up you go, the more expensive the real estate is because you have a better view and it's more exclusive. But here, the higher up you go, the longer it takes you to get up and down from your space. And therefore, the upper floors would remain virtually unused and thereby be open to hacking. And these were based on some real stories that were found from anywhere from someone who had installed a hot tub on a generator in a mini storage facility to guys who had a monthly pool um, meeting where they would, they would play pool in a very cramped mini storage in um, Manhattan. Our site for this was also uh, proposed to be across from the Disney Hall because we felt that, well, we need a very large site for this parking. There's not a lot of parking on Bunker Hill, so we want to provide more parking, and so we'll provide it there. Also, um, we decided that you know, what Bunker Hill needed more of was, again, less icons and more infrastructure. Because after all, if you strip away all the icons from Bunker Hill, that's all that you'll have left is the infrastructure, since the hill, original hill was removed in the 50s. So um, we designed this with the idea that it would be as suburban as possible, to be as simple as possible, so you can back your car right into your space and unload from your trunk, whatever it is, into the storage facility. And so here is um, some diagrams and some traditional schematic drawings. We always produce traditional schematics for our projects because those are the easiest read. And then this is the diagram showing the uses as you go up in height. So available units increase, as do hackers. We did find an article and someone was cheating on their spouse for eight years in a mini storage facility. So that's how we got the cheater paradigm. And by the time you get to the top, um, there's a balance of available units and rented units and then a lot of hacking going on. And then there's a rendering of what that might look like across on the Disney Hall. More muscular than Gary. So I'm almost done. Um, another interesting phenomena that's occurred in Los Angeles is we have this sort of guilt about our skyline. I've had several people visit LA and sort of comment on how small our skyline looks. And I always, usually driving back from LAX, comment to them, well, you're just looking at it from the wrong angle. If you move slightly to the east, it looks bigger. But in fact, we have a pretty small skyline. But the idea was that, um, Skylines since September 11th have come to signify something new. In certain ways, they're a liability. But in, also, in other ways, they were the last gasp, if you accept the housing market, of capitalism's expansion. And this was done largely through purely iconic buildings. And we think of a lot of the projects that went up in Dubai since 2001. Um, China is certainly no stranger as a Southeast Asia to sort of very odd skyscrapers that define their skylines. REM actually was trying to get away from producing the 300th or 350th skyscraper for Beijing when he produced CCTV because he said there were already too many. And so um, we proposed uh, in light of the fact that there was rampant unemployment uh, in the collapsing economy for a giant compost bin that would provide people with compost so that they could generate gardens to feed themselves since the government wasn't going to do it. We also were interested in the role that the Twin Towers played right before their demise uh, in juxtaposition with um, a sort of ecstatic formalism that was produced or proposed in New York by Frank Gehry and others but never built. So again, we have our sort of manifesto. And um, we also were interested in the rise of sustainability or the philosophy of sustainability within architecture to the point where it had become a kind of religion where those of us who were sort of teaching studios were sort of thinking nothing but sustainability and beginning to forget that actually design was, was sort of important too. And visual expression was still rather valid in many ways. And buildings were becoming so tech oriented that they were losing their allure and mystery. And so, Slop scraper act is an intensity of that sort of religion of sustainability and that not only is it a giant compost bin, but it generates its own power and power for the surrounding neighborhood through the um, compression of the methane gas. Um, and as uh, the compost comes out the bottom, 
um, it can be quickly scooped up and used to produce more green space and gardens throughout the city. In addition, the skyscraper's facade, which when empty is rather flaccid so that anywhere in the city you know when you can go get compost, um, when it becomes uh, engorged with decayed matter, it expands and contracts based on the uh, transfer of methane around the structure, giving the politicians their visual icon that they want for the skyline. So again, in all our projects, we always interrogate the culture of modernism and how it's impacted not just post-modernity, but contemporary design culture. So we use a lot of visual cues from previous projects. Um, and we, in the, the uh, sort of culture of contemporary music, try to do as many mashups as possible so that we produce the sort of largest array of visual effects. This is a section showing the expansion of the methane. So then again, schematic plans and diagrams showing how the garbage comes in and the garbage comes out. This is a constituency using the top of the skyscraper. And then there's the happy city of Los Angeles that now has its bustling skyline, which depending on the number of unemployed who need to make their own food, just will get, keep getting bigger and we suggested at the end of the pamphlet that you recycle it rather than throwing it away. So last project. Um, this is an ongoing project and one that we have been engaged in for about a year. And we find it to be interesting because not only is it in a way a proto-historical in that it's going back to our original work, but it is opening some new doors that we thought we had entered, but we found that when we went and did our survey in the field, were, had remained closed. And a lot of this had to do with the psychology and urbanism surrounding the skyscraper. I think a lot of us that now are seduced in various ways by reading Sucker Punch or other blog, um, sort of blogs that celebrate uh, the proliferation of vertical architecture in other places. And we don't really think about those, uh, the sort of repercussions behind that culture. And what was interesting, especially about this particular article, is it reinforced my own philosophies at how ar architecture in its current manifestation has forgotten about the kind of psychological trauma that has, that has the ability to instigate within a society. So much so that you can have a Minoru Yamasaki tower that's in Oklahoma be a generator of fear for its inhabitants simply because of the brand not because of any strategic location. So in searching for a way to document our prey, we opted to embrace LA's sort of culture of the celebrity and embody the star map as our way of investigating LA's skyscraper further. For those of you who aren't familiar with the sky star map, it's kind of um, sham. You can go buy it for apparently $5.99 anywhere. Um, and uh, upon buying the star map, if you are brave enough to go venture out on your own, you'll find that much of the information is either superfluous or completely false, and that it leads you to no real stars. Most of the time you approach locked gates, you um, go to the wrong house, the house in some cases may have been torn down, or the house may never have existed in the first place. And to us, this was really fascinating because in a way, it talked about the larger culture surrounding skyscrapers in Los Angeles. They're here, but we sort of ignore them in our daily existence. So we generated the first of what will be many Wilshire star maps. Um, this first star map, uh, when it was generated, didn't have that many stars in it. And so we sort of said, well, if we are projective about this, we can just keep generating these things and keep adding to it, and maybe people will keep buying them. So um, the Wilshire star maps is an abbreviated guide for its first iteration. And I have a kind of closing manifesto which I think uh, cements the project. And I'm just going to read it since it's, it's um, a, little, a little long. So despite the global follies of the post 9-11 architectural academy in Dubai, China, Manhattan, and beyond, we at Urban Operations still believe in the typology of the skyscraper and embrace the latent potential within its ability to absorb and redistribute the sociological and psychological ephemera of capitalism into democratic terrain. 
No other place in the world has such a fantastic collection of under-recognized and under-appreciated vertical architecture as in Los Angeles. And in a city of mostly low-density avenues and sprawling suburban tracts, no other street in LA contains as many of these modernicus erectus as Wilshire Boulevard. Stretching 16 miles from downtown Los Angeles to the Pacific Ocean in Santa Monica, Wilshire is home to a majority of the B-list actors constituting LA's 20th century urban skyline, because only until recently have we gotten anything new downtown. With only a handful of skyscrapers having made it into the guidebooks, Wilshire is the perpetual proving ground for the ugly, the ordinary, and in most critics' minds, the vertically challenged. However, these are not nip and tucked Brangelinas in architectural culture, but rough and ready stunt doubles who work twice as hard for their place in LA's urban legacies. Their stories are complex and infinitely more interesting than their pedigreed counterparts, for their lack of glamour and prestige has made them fertile catalysts and dynamic armatures of programmatic clustering beyond anything the avant-garde could ever hope to achieve. Containing an almost infinite programmatic menagerie ranging from high-end litigators to down and at heel happy ending day spas, the skyscrapers of Wilshire, while dismissed because of their visual banality and obvious lack of height, contain both performative and social lessons for designers and planners alike. Instead of erasing slices of urban territory from the public realm, Wilshire's more than 50 high-rises instead expand LA's public street stapes into the sky that unlike the front page follies of Ground Zero, have the substance and cultural endurance to give birth to real urban complexity. Thank you very much.